So this is the case of uh, ENCA associated granulomatous vasculitis coming to chief complaint. The chief complaint was diplopia and darkening of vision in the right eye. History of present illness. Please pay particular attention to what is occurring to which eye. What is happening to right eye and to the left eye. A 54 year old gentleman noticed binocular vertical diplopia four months prior to presentation. The patient felt his symptoms were progressively worsening. Furthermore, over the last week, while driving on the interstate, he noticed the vision in the right eye was starting to darken. During this four-month period, the patient was followed by an otolaryngologist for his sinus disease and nosebleeds. These symptoms had been present for the past 10 months. He was treated with cautery for the epistaxis and ultimately a polypectomy slash enstrostomy was performed. On post-operative day number one, he noticed the otolaryngologist uh, notified the uh, ENT surgeon that he, his diplopia was still present, although his nosebleeds and sinus disease had improved. Postoperatively, one week postoperatively, the patient awoke with a bulging left eye. This was accompanied by a left-sided facial droop. He was believed to have a Bell's palsy and was started on doxycycline and prednisolone, 40 mg daily by a local emergency room physician. The patient followed up with his otolaryngologist the next day and the prednisone was increased to 80 mg per day for his Bell's palsy on the left side. With no improvement after one week of the above treatment, he underwent decompression of the left facial nerve. During these events, his diplopia persisted and he was referred to a neuro-ophthalmologist. The darkening of vision in the right eye remained throughout this entire time period. The following is a summary of the laterality in this patient's symptoms prior to presenting to us. Initial symptom was binocular vertical diplopia, then darkening of the vision in the right eye, and then postoperatively left eye proptosis accompanied by left sided facial droop. Past ocular history is significant for presbyopia. Medical history and past surgical history uh, is significant for deviated septum, nasal polyps, hernia repair, tonsillectomy, polypectomy, right and left maxillary entrostomy. Medications include ciprofloxacin and dexamethasone drops to ears, dexamethasone ortic drop ciprodex to his ears. Refresh PM uh, which is a mineral oil white petrolatum lubricant eye ointment that he is uh, putting in his eyes. He has no known drug allergies and his family history is non-contributory. Coming to his social history, no alcohol use, tobacco use uh, is there uh, uh, which is one pack per day for the last 30 years. Coming to his ocular examination, visual acuity 20 by 100 pin holding to 20 by 60 in the right eye, 20 by 40 pin holding to 20 by 25 in the left eye. Pupils 4 mm in dark, 2 mm in light, brisk equal. Uh, 1.2 log unit RAPD was uh, present in the right eye. Intraocular pressure by applination was 15 millimeters of mercury in the right eye and 20 in the left eye. Extraocular motility was full in both eyes and he was orthotropic. Confrontation visual fears. 
showed infratemporal deficit in the right eye whereas it was full in the left eye. External examination, normal right eye, facial droop, ptosis, proptosis, 3 mm inferior scleral show on the left side, hurdle exophthalmometry measurement at base of 95 mm was 20 mm in the right eye and 24 mm in the left eye. So here we have got a photograph of this patient. External photograph and you can see all of these changes over here. So there is a left sided facial droop as you can see. Coming to slit limb examination. Lids and lashes normal both eyes. Conjunctiva and sclera normal in both eyes but there were some dilated episcleral veins inferiorly in the left eye. Cornea was clear in both eyes, anterior chamber was deep and quiet in both eyes, iris had normal architecture in both eyes, lens showed trace nuclear sclerosis and cortical cataracts on both sides, vitreous was normal in both eyes. Coming to dilated fundus examination, disc showed mild temporal disc pallor in the right eye and optic disc edema in the left eye. The cup to disc ratio was 0.35 on the right side, 0.25 on the left side. Macula was flat in both eyes, vessels normal in both eyes. There was some AV nicking noted in the left eye. Periphery normal for the right eye and showed dot hemorrhages and chorioretinal scar infrotemporally in the left eye. Fundus photographs demonstrating the optic disc edema of the left optic nerve and a chorioretinal scar infrotemporally on the left side and pallor of the right side as you can see in these images. Then we have got the optical coherence tomography demonstrating increased nerve fiber layer thickness in the left optic nerve. And here we have initial Goldman visual field test uh, illustrating a dense relative secocentral scotoma in the right eye, as you can see here. And then we got the MRI of the brain with gadolinium. These are coronal T2 fat suppressed images showing the hyper intense lesion between the medial rectus and the lamina papyracea in the left orbit as you can see here. Hospital course. The patient underwent extensive examination and testing by multiple services including neuroophthalmology, oculoplastics and otolaryngology. He initially underwent an endoscopic biopsy which demonstrated acute and chronic inflammation with fibrosis. In the meantime, the patient's visual acuity worsened to hand motion in the right eye and 20 by 150 in the left eye with worsening of the visual fields. Given the pathology report above, the leading working diagnosis was idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome or IOIS. Therefore, high dose steroids were studied. The patient received methylprednisolone 1000 mg intravenously for 3 days and then started a slow oral prednisolone taper starting at 80 mg. With steroid therapy, the patient's visual acuity and visual field testing initially improved over the short term. So here we have got Goldman visual field pre and post high dose steroids. And you can see a remarkable improvement. However, over the next month the patient failed to improve. If the diagnosis had been IOIS, we would have expected a rapid resolution of his symptoms. At this point, the various involved medical teams re-evaluated the situation, uh, which should always be done when the patient does not respond as expected to the management. The situation was discussed between the oculoplastic surgeons, neuro-ophthalmologist, and otolaryngologist and the decision was made to re-biopsy the lesion. An anterior orbitotomy was performed 
through a transcranicular approach by the oculoplastics team. The biopsy showed sclerotic tissue with a scattered chronic granulobitis inflammation with patchy infiltrates and necrosis. The differential diagnosis included ANCA-associated granulobitis vasculitis and idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome. So here we have got some histology slides. Hematoxidin and eosin stain 20 times uh, bio magnification of the biopsy demonstrating a patchy infiltrative pattern. The sclerotic tissue showed a scattered chronic granulomatous inflammatory infiltrate and focal areas of necrosis as you can see here. And here we have hematoxylin and eosin stain 50 times, 50x magnification. Uh, patchy infiltrates show polymorphologic group of cells including plasma cells, lymphocytes, monocytes with focal areas of necrosis. Lymphoma was ruled out with immunohistochemistry stains with CD20 and CD79A. Of note, the more typical pathology seen in the ANCA associated granulomatous vasculitis shows occlusion of the vessels representing a vasculitis as well as interstitial granulomas. There are also polymorphic inflammatory infiltrates. The absence of these entities does not necessarily rule out the diagnosis of granulomatosis with polyangiitis, which is GPA. Disease limited to the orbit alone or orbit and sinuses such as in our patient has been reported to show a more polymorphous pattern of uh, infiltrative cells uh, which includes plasma cells, histiocytes, epithelioid cells and eosinophils compared to patients with systemic and associated granulomatous vasculitis. Laboratory workup was performed including C and titer, which is a cytoplasmic, anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody, titer, which is 93% sensitive and 97% specific for systemic and associated granulomatous vasculitis. In limited orbital or orbital sinus disease, the sensitivity is variable between 32 to 67%. Our patient's C and cartiter was more than 1 ratio 80, whereas normal is less than 1 ratio 20, so it was positive. He was referred to the rheumatology service and started on cyclophosphamide with intention to transition to methotrexate once in remission. So what is the final diagnosis here? This is an ANCA associated granulomatous vasculitis. Coming to the summary of this condition, now what is the epidemiology? Incidence is 10 cases per million per year. 90% patients are Caucasians, middle-aged population but can be seen in younger or older patients. The symptoms include the ocular symptoms include diplopia, eye pain, decreased vision, decreased visual field. And the systemic symptoms include hearing loss, hemoptysis, joint pain, and neuropathy. Coming to signs, again signs can be ocular or systemic. The ocular signs include proptosis, eyelid edema, ophthalmoplegia, sepuritis, conjunctivitis, uveitis, and apicicleritis. The systemic signs include rhinitis, renal failure, apistaxis, perforated septum causing saddle nose deformity, gingivitis, subglottal stenosis, pulmonary nodules, cavitary lesions, hemorrhage, etc. Now what is the treatment? Cyclophosphamide is the first line of treatment for most in conjunction with corticosteroids. So 1 mg per kg per day of the corticosteroid, 2 mg per kg per day for oral cyclophosphamide. IV pulse doses of cyclophosphamide can be given in more severe disease uh, with along with corticosteroids. Once in remission, switch to methotrexate or azathioprine. Corticosteroids can be tapered to a low maintenance dose once remission is achieved. Plasma phoresis in very severe disease, including pulmonary involvement, or other end organ damage. 
Alternative options in severe disease unresponsive to the above treatment includes mycophenolate mofetil, 12-deoxy um, spergualine antithymocyte globulin rituximab infliximab. Now finally, what is the differential diagnosis of this condition? Of course, ANCA-associated granulomatous vasculitis, but it can also be lymphoma, idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome, jerk straw syndrome, microscopic polyangiitis, and relapsing polychondritis.